I think the most impressive transition for me is when a person realizes that they can make a change, that they can improve the world. Now, for me, that happened when I was a kid. 50 years ago, I was watching the Apollo 11 moonshot where three astronauts were blasted off the Earth in a Saturn rocket and were venturing toward the moon. And as a child, I just saw all of the impressiveness of technology, of science, of humans' capability. And I watched the moon as it left the Earth's orbit, went around the orbit around the moon, and then the lunar lander separated and then landed safely on the moon. And then two astronauts came out, first Neil Armstrong and then Buzz Aldrin. And Neil Armstrong said his famous quote, one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind. While the third astronaut, another guy, Sorry. In titio. Just in titio. Now, th this titio, very few people know his name, but he played an important role. He, he brought Neil and Buzz back to the Earth safely. And as a child, it just mesmerized me that we could do this as, human, as humans. The capacity that a human had to be able to put a man on the moon. And another fact for me was really important was this, this Tizio, his name was Michael Collins. He was actually my father's roommate in college. And as a kid, I looked at my father and I said, okay, my father is just some Tizio, I mean, just a normal guy. And I had to be a normal guy and Michael Collins, therefore, had to be just a normal person. And therefore, that Michael could actually impact the world. Him, as a normal person, could change the world by allowing Neil and Buzz to land on the earth. And so on one side of me, I looked at this and I thought, this is fantastic. Humanity could do anything. Seven years later, I was 14, and I realized that humanity can actually do anything, and it could actually be in a negative sense, in the sense that humanity can do global warming. Humanity can do tons of, well, billions of tons of plastic into the ocean, and they can do deforestation, and I can go on with the list. So humanity has this capacity to do terrible things and to do good things. And as a 14-year-old, as a I wanted to change that. And at that time, humanity seemed to me to be represented best by pizza dough. Okay, so how you make pizza dough? Well, actually, it's really ironic to have an American on stage full of Italian audience, and I'm going to explain to you how to make pizza dough. So you take a bowl, you put flour, you put water, you put salt, you put a little bit of olive oil, and you put yeast into the bowl, and you mix it all up. And then something happens. The yeast see the sugar in the flour, and they start eating the sugar. And then they multiply. And then they eat, multiply, eat, multiply. And then suddenly you'll see that the dough starts to rise. And this process continues of eating, multiplying, eating, and multiplying up to the point where it stops. And what's happened is that there's nothing else for the yeast to eat. They've eaten all the sugar. And all you're left with is what the yeast could not eat, dead yeast, and the excrement of the yeast. Now, to me, humanity is very much like that. We have a finite surface on the earth. We have a finite set of resources. And all we are doing is eating, multiplying, eating, and multiplying with no regard for the future. And for all of our creativity and all of our intelligence on this side that could put a man on the moon, on this side, we're only really as intelligent as yeast, which is pretty embarrassing. So at the age of 14, I wanted to find an escape route. I wanted to be able to join other scientists to be able to find a solution to provide us 
an energy source that would go on for not just one, 10, 50, nor a thousand, but millions of generations. And that's this, the sun. If you think about it, the sun has been alive, burning for 4.7 billion years. And it has another estimated 5 billion years of life to go. That's roughly 10 billion years and is generating 10 to the 24th kilowatts every moment. That dwarfs any number that we can imagine. And the sun doesn't change its size. It just keeps burning and burning and burning. And so about 100 years ago, the scientists of the day, around 1920, they started to realize what's actually happening here. And they said, if we could do this on Earth, we've solved our energy problems. So since 1920, we've been trying to make a sun on Earth. What's the process? It's called actually nuclear fusion. And the idea is if I take, if I go out to the ocean, take a liter of water, I take a little bit of hydro, a special hydrogen isotope out of that water, put the other liter back into the ocean so I don't damage the ocean, and I take those two isotopes, and I want to put them together. I want to fuse them together. But the trick is, they're positively charged. Positives repel, and so I have to force these together. So I have to have some way of combining, fusing these atoms together. That's the trick, okay? So to do that, you have three parameters, temperature, density, and confinement time. You guys didn't know it, but you're getting a physics lessons. <laughs> so for the temperature first, for a physicist, temperature and velocity are the same thing. It gets warm because gas particles are moving faster. So what we want to do is have a high temperature, fast velocity, so they can come up and they can collide. They can overcome this positive force. And the temperature to do that is 150 million degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's 10 times hotter than the sun. So you can see the challenge. Next is density. So if I'm sitting over on one side of the stage, and I have a friend on the other side, and we're trying to throw atoms at each other, the probability that those atoms will collide is zero, no chance. But if we throw more atoms at each other, the more they are, the greater the probability these atoms will collide. So we play with this concept of density. We try to increase the number of atoms. That way, we increase the probability of a collision, and we get more energy. And the third is confinement time. So if my friend and I get into a box, and then we throw our atoms at each other, and they bounce off the walls, there's a greater chance that either on the first pass, second pass, or third pass, the balls will, or the atoms will collide and give off energy. So confinement is our ability to hold these atoms that are really hot in place. The only problem <laughs> is we need a box that can handle 150 million degrees Celsius, 10 times hotter than the sun. So what we do is we use a magnetic field. Okay, so we've learned that a charged particle will oscillate around a magnetic field. This is pretty much how the northern lights work. You have charged particles coming from the sun, they interact with the magnetic field of the Earth, and they either go to the northern or southern pole to create either the northern lights or the southern lights. We use exactly the same principle, but what we do is we create a magnetic field that's in a circular loop. This way, these atoms are charged, they're trapped, and they will go around and around and around. So we create a, magnetic, a set of magnets that are kind of D-shaped. We orientate them around our loop, and it forms kind of a donut shape or a bagel. Now that bagel or donut uses is our magnetic trap or our magnetic bottle. And I want to show you an example of today's magnetic bottle. This is a tokamak discharge. Tokamak is what we call our magnetic bottle. Um, and this shows our little miniature sun. And what you see is on the edges where you see the light, that's a measly 10,000 degrees Celsius. It's cold. But in the center part of the donut, where you don't really see anything, that's about 100 million degrees Celsius. So we're almost there. And what we're trying to do is we have tokamaks built all around the world in Russia, China, Japan, Korea, India, US, and Europe. 
and we're using all of this combined knowledge to build a better tokamak. And if you've looked in our progress since the beginning, we built small tokamaks, bigger tokamaks, bigger tokamaks, and we basically doubled our performance every 1.5 years. Up to the point of around the year 2000, we were able to create a reaction where the amount of energy we put in equals the amount of energy out. We call that break even. At this point, uh, this was achieved, by the way, in JET, the Joint European Tokamak, where the Europeans have pulled together to build this tokamak. At this point, we've decided to work together in a large environment where all nations are coming together, mainly Russia, China, US, Japan, North Korea, South Korea, uh, India, and Europe, are combining resources to build ITER. That's where I work. It's in the south of France. And our goal is to build a machine that performs 10 times better. So we have one watt going in equals 10 watts out. It's an experimental device. And then from that, we decided to build, we want to build a thing called DEMO, a demonstration reactor that would actually produce electricity. Now, that would be a very large donut, about 20 meters in diameter. Now, if you notice on this curve, we were going straight up, and then suddenly it flats. Why? Well, as you big builder tokamaks, it takes longer. It's more complicated. It's more sophisticated, there's more stronger forces involved, and it, we need more money. But the time is actually the critical one. Because if you think about it, fusion, if you look on this graph, we would have a demonstration reactor in 2060. So if a politician came up to you and said, give me your vote, I want to increase your taxes so that I can find a solution so that your grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren or great-great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren have a solution for energy. You're going to say no, because you're on the side of the yeast. We want our immediate return. And so this has inherently blocked us to be able to look long-term to be able to find a solution. So fortunately, what we're doing now is all the parties are pulling in a little bit of taxes, a little bit of money to be able to work collectively to build this thing called ITER, an international toroidal experimental reactor. And then from that, we can move forward. And what we hope one day is that we will be able to use this technology to build reactors around the world. For example, in Italy, Italy we would build probably around 15 reactors. We would take the liter of water from the ocean, pull out the hydrogen, the hydrogen atoms, put the liter back in, each liter would be equivalent to about 200, 350 gallons of gas, uh, liters of gasoline. And with that, we'd be able to power all of Italy. Electricity, transportation, heat, industry, everything. Now, this is not tomorrow. This is maybe 50 years, 100 years down the road. But then from this technology, we would have the energy, not just for 100 generations, but the energy content stored in the oceans would last humanity for 100 billion years. That's like seven times the age of the universe. So it's just a perpetual motion machine of energy source. And what's blocking us? It's not the technology. The technology is challenging, but we can achieve that. To me, what's blocking us is ourselves. We have to get past, we have to become more educated than the yeast. We have to look beyond the moment we have to solve our problems, of course, for the ocean, for the global warming, deforestation, everything, and also look for our future generations as they have the rights that we have. Thank you very much, and welcome to the Fusion Age.